so I think that if we're able to plug those kinds of things in the orientation, in our case, we're at a debate and say like, this is, this is who we are. This is our campus. This is, this is, these are our expectations. These are the norms. Um, and, and they're the norms in, in classes too, and in, in residence halls. And we set that tone and expectation from day one. I think that that really is helpful, but I agree that it needs to be something that's sustained um, and not just not a, just a one-off that we then don't deliver on um, beyond the orientation. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to Heterodox Academy's virtual event for the month of August on leveraging student orientation programs to promote open inquiry and viewpoint diversity. My name is Michael Regnier. I'm the executive director at HXA, and uh, we're pleased to dig into a really uh, juicy topic and, and a very timely one. You know, this time of year, uh, students are arriving on college and university campuses for the first time. Uh, those institutions are doing all kinds of things to try to orient them. Um, but what does that really mean? What does it mean to introduce students to uh, academic life in general and you know participation in, in a particular community? Uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to digging into that and to the connection with all the conversations that HXA members have about the importance of viewpoint diversity of open inquiry, truth seeking, and, and really, you know, what are the deepest purposes uh, of a college or university. Um, so joining me today are some expert uh, perspectives from inside the academy in different ways. Uh, I'm joined by Adam Davis, who directs the Liska Center at Denison University and is a history professor there. Uh, Joseph Guarneri, who is a student affairs uh, Director, Associate Director at Sacred Heart University, where he's involved in strategic enrollment management, uh, and my colleague at HXA, Dr. Martha McCoy, uh, who is our Director of Campus Engagement and previously uh, has been a longtime professor, uh, most of all uh, at Appalachian State, uh, where she was a sociologist for many years and involved in, in uh, faculty leadership efforts. Um, so I'd like to welcome all of you. Um, before we get into the meat of the conversation today, a couple of our uh, standard reminders. Uh, first of all, uh, let's try to practice what we preach when it comes to the HXA way. So we'll ask everyone to have a look at our principles here shown on screen. Uh, and let's practice that not only in this uh, discussion, but, but in the chat. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn uh, when we when we listen and we we are constructive with each other, uh, and you know, change begins at home and all that. Um, if you have questions and comments you'd like to drop in the chat, uh, you're welcome to. The Q and A box in Zoom is also available, uh, and there you can not only pose your own questions, but if you see a great question someone else asked, you can get it an up give it an upvote so that uh, it it's more likely to to come to our attention near the uh, near the second part of, of our conversation. Um, finally, uh, I will invite with, uh, with a lot of, of warm enthusiasm, if you're joining us for the first time, it might be that you should be a member of Heterodox Academy. Uh, faculty, university, staff, uh, graduate students, even undergraduate students are welcome to join HXA. We'd love to have you. Membership is free and you can learn more at heterodoxacademy.org or follow us on social media. Uh, if you're not an academic uh, insider working in higher ed in some way, that's okay. We'd love to have you as a supporter, as a follower. So please go to our website, sign up. We'll send you a weekly email and, and you can help you know, keep, your, uh, keep your eyes on what's going on, uh, on on these issues. All right, without further ado then, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to dive in and we'll, uh, We'll just get it started, but again, please remember to uh, to leave your comments in the chat. Um, so my first question, and Joseph, I can put this to you, just maybe orient us a little bit, no pun intended. Um, the the topic of, of orientation uh, can mean a lot of different things in different places, uh, and it, maybe it's different than, than, uh, than when some of our, our listeners uh, remember their own experiences. So you work in student affairs these days. As you look out at higher education, what's sort of a typical program for, for first year orientation, just so that we all have a common point of reference? Absolutely. Um, and so 
orientation, you know, today, and it's been this way for the last, you know, I'd say a few, few decades, orientation is the uh, the beginning of a student's uh, physical transition into a university. So I say uh, physical because, you know, at that point they've <clears throat> um, inquired about an institution, they've applied, gotten in, uh, decided to go, and now comes orientation. It's time for them to get integrated into the university's values and 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 tradition. So it really serves to do two things. It introduces students to the campus's uh, social scene and uh, the the programs and activities uh, and also resources available to them. And it's also uh, like serves to um, integrate them into the institution's academic community you know, with its like norms and in intellectual expectations. Um, st uh, student affairs tends to handle uh, the first part of that. And then academic affairs tends to, you know, handle uh, like the second part. And the, the way that this is kind of done, you know, besides the on-campus com component, you know, sometimes they're overnight, sometimes uh, it's a full day, sometimes two days is a mix of you know everything from uh uh from you know ice icebreaker activities educational activities you know aimed at um in, instilling all of those you know values and you know everything from that to guest lectures to you know academic advising appointments um uh events where you know uh, students get to meet pr professors and other, you know, on-campus uh, pr professionals. And um, so I think that's a uh, just a general overview. And um, I think, yeah, you know, we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's really useful. Um, Martha, so Joseph mentioned that, you know, student affairs and the faculty are involved in planning these sorts of programs. Um, I know you've had some exposure to kind of how the sausage gets made. Uh, what's your perspective? Is it as simple as sort of student affairs does the social and faculty does the the meaning and research or, or do those get blurred a little bit sometimes? Well, I think it is important that both student affairs and academic affairs um, have roles in new student orientation. They're obviously both very important and they could work in a complementary way, but I'm afraid on some campuses, um, and I saw this on mine at times when I directed the first year seminar and the common reading programs, which touched all the first year students and was part of orientation, um, that there are sometimes divergent goals or the, the student affairs folks and the academic affairs folks um, if we're not careful, wind up working at cross purposes. Um, student affairs, understandably, tend to be more concerned with, you know, legal compliance and uh, trainings on um, suicide prevention and how to navigate conflict with your roommate and helping students develop that important sense of belonging. Um, whereas academic affairs on that side of the house is more interested in um, emphasizing academic inquiry and rigor and the importance of critical thinking and the viewpoint diversity that grows naturally out of our collective search for truth. Um, and I think we we have to be careful to make sure that we are not um, uh, giving the students mixed messages. And I, I did see that. I'm, I'm concerned that that's happening. And I think faculty aren't involved enough um, on some campuses. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful uh, pointer to some of the potential tensions there. So uh, Adam, you've you've been a faculty member who did get involved over the last couple of years. Would you tell us about that, the, the programs that you were involved with and, and sort of uh, how you see that fitting into this question of what what purpose orientation programs serve? Uh, sure. Um, maybe just a preface, you know, at Denison, traditionally, we've actually had um, two different orientation periods, one in June 
um, where the students who have are matriculating come for what's much more kind of an academic orientation and then one right before the beginning of the first semester for first years um, in what we called August orientation at the end of August, which tends to be much more student life student affairs um, centered. Um, but like Martha, you know, I have concerns about seeing these as uh, binaries and, and, and you know, uh, with, with different ends. And I think the best orientations um, blend and fuse those two and are sort of hybrids of student affairs and academic and that we all should be uh, rowing in the same direction and, and have many of the same goals. And I know that our own student affairs uh, team at Denison is um, much more than, you know, a cruise director kind of role, they have a, a really a, a genuine um, interest in the academic side uh, of life um, at Denison. So, so about a year ago, um, because of a partnership that, that we forged at Denison over the last few years um, with Braver Angels, the, the national depolarization organization, probably familiar to a lot of uh, Heterodox Academy members, um, and it's actually an alliance of three organizations, Braver Angels, ACTA, and Bridge USA. Um, we had been uh, running campus debates um, on Denison's campus for several years, Braver Angel style, style debates that are not competitive uh, uh, debates that like a debate team would do, but really, um, you know, the community coming together to engage in difficult conversations about, about complicated issues. Um, and these had been very successful. Our, our student body um, really benefited from, from these debates. And we thought it was really our president's idea. What if we were to incorporate um, a Braver Angel style debate as part of first year orientation, um, which we did last year for the first time last August with all 660 um, incoming first year students on the topic. Uh, the resolution was should Denison regulate uh, speech on on campus, um, and it was a great success. We had three concurrent debates, all on the same topic, in three different auditoriums. Um, we weren't sure whether nervous first year students um, who are you know just getting their footing, just figuring out you know where their room is, who their roommate is, and so forth, would have the the bravery to to stand up and give a three or four minute extemporaneous speech or ask a question. Um, and to our great uh, relief, we had lines of, of first year students lining up to to ask questions to give speeches. It was a really robust debate and then a, a wonderful 30 minute workshop following um, to kind of process what had just happened and to think collectively about how um, the this experience, this debate could apply and, and transfer to the classroom the next day. The next day was the first day of classes, as well as to um, meals in the dining hall, sitting in the residence halls late at night talking about difficult issues. And so that's really where I do think the, the academic and the student affairs piece can come together in, in, in a program like that. We're um, doing the same thing next week, a uh, week from Sunday here at Denison, this time on the topic of AI. Uh, will, will AI cause more harm than good? Um, and um, we're, we're excited to, to see how that goes next week. Well, it sounds like a, a, a vibrant initiative. And of course, as you said, we are, we are uh, fans of, of all the organizations that you named there. Um, it does seem like a, a, a high order, you know, we, to, to sort of bring those sides of campus together, so to speak. And, and um, I, I don't want to keep calling on individual people, so I'll just open it up to anyone who wants to address this. But it does seem like uh, the, um, at the front door. speaking of AI, someone's at my front door. Um, it does seem like there's a, a question of uh, the message that we're sending, right? So if one message is, you belong here, bring your whole self to campus, we will support you. Uh, we will help you problem solve. And then another message is, but your ideas and even your more, most cherished values are going to be challenged in this place. That's an unusual sort of orientation. You don't get that at a typical, you know, new job corporate uh, HR presentation. So um, is, there, is there hope that, you know, we can instill that sort of nuance with new students or, um, or, or is it going to sort of take some kind of, of further engagement? I, I, I'd love 
anybody's thoughts on, on that question. Joseph? Uh, uh, yes, so I'd love to actually uh, chime in on that. So I agree that there is a disconnect. There is a, a tendency for the, the student affairs half of that e equation to kind of dominate or orientation. And I can briefly explain like, like exactly why that is. So on the, the student affairs end of things, our work and Heather, that's, 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 that's through our, you know, professional organizations, you know, that, that we keep up with our, our graduate, um, educations. Um, a lot of us have, you know, educational backgrounds in counseling and education. The, the core of that like work is, is research on the academy and specifically research on college transition and adjustment that essentially argues that a student who is uh who is uh who feels that they belong and are are more and is more in, in Included throughout uh, the campus social sphere is more likely to to stay at that institution, do well, thrive, and so I feel that you know we do a, a good job within orientation programs with that. However, what we admittedly forget is, you know, that's that's only half of the. Um, equation. Students' um, uh, ability and tendency to to remain at an institution, persist, and do well is also part cognitive and 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 intellectual. They have to be immersed in an academic program um, that they are passionate about. Um, et cetera. And we know that throughout research, you know, as well. So I think, you know, when we try to uh, pull, pull all of that together, you know, in, in the name of uh, viewpoint diversity and, you know, construct this disagreement and all of that, I think it would help if student affairs professionals un un understood um to a a higher ex extent how important the in, in the the in, in intellectual and in in class development is to 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 students on uh both in the long term and then also you know in that key uh, first semester or two, and, tr and and try to pull faculty in uh, when they can, because all you know what we're advocating for open inquiry viewpoint to diversity is the core of, of, of the academic side. Um, so I, I definitely am always you know advocating on my side, like student affairs, to pull faculty in. And I add to what Joseph was just saying, just to say that even, even pulling faculty in, which is one of the things I tried to do, um, isn't easy. So when you think of the, um, the common reading programs, which are often part of um, a, a new student orientation experience, they receive the book sometime in the summer and they're asked to read it over the summer and then they come and have a session about it maybe the weekend before classes start. It can be a wonderful way to introduce students to the intellectual purpose of the university and um, and to the place of the you know, and, and to the, the university as a place of polyvocality, that there are going to be multiple perspectives on this book from different disciplines, from different political points of view, and so forth. But we can all have this conversation across all these differences. Um, so it seems like a great idea. Um, but at the same time, it, some of you might know the National Association of Scholars followed for about a decade all of the books that were selected across all of these hundreds of colleges 
and that um, really were more social justice message oriented books or, um, and even on my own campus, there were um, faculty members who were promoting their own book to be selected for the Common Read um, because we, we had thousands of freshmen. That's a lot of book sales. <laughs> and then, when, and they believed in their book. Um, we also had, um, as the Common Reading Director, I got um, messages and promotional materials from publishers suggesting that this should be the common reading book that we select because, again, it's a cash cow for publishers. Um, and then if even if we picked a book that we thought really was, you know, uh, something that appealed to a, a wide variety of disciplines and raised a lot of interesting questions and we weren't picking it because it had some message we wanted everyone to swallow, people still accused us of selecting the book for that reason. And so it made me realize how important it is to make sure that you frame for students and everybody else who's watching what's going on, the reason you're engaging in what you're engaging in, the reason you have a common reading book or you have whatever orientation activity it is, whether it's one of those giant uh, inflatables, you know, those giant inflatable chairs and they climb up there and they have a photo op, okay? That Those are part of orientations too. If it's, if it's one of those, or if it's a get to know you game, or if it's a dining hall activity, or if it's a common reading, or if it's a constructive dialogue session or a debate, why do we have that? How does that align with the purpose of the university and with the discovery and dissemination of new knowledge? And I think that can really go a long way to frame what we're doing, But because I think it is just to acknowledge it's a real challenge. So even if we just add some more faculty and stir, we won't necessarily solve the, the problem because we, we have to be really clear what we're doing, including even with constructive dialogue. There's a different reason to have constructive dialogue on a college campus at a university than say at your bowling alley or in your church or synagogue or somewhere else. Constructive dialogue on a college campus is not just about having a kumbaya moment where everyone feels understood by others. We are trying to weed out bad ideas and and find the good ideas or the credible ideas and sort them from the non-credible. So um, not every opinion is equal. Um, so it's a little different at the, in the academy to have those conversations. And I think it's important to explain that to students and, and, their, and their parents and family members as well. Mm -hmm. Adam? No, I, I totally agree. Um, just, just to piggyback on, on Martha's comments, um, especially the point about, it, you know, don't think that it's enough to just recruit some faculty and, and stir um, you know, I, I, I totally understand uh, uh, and appreciate Joseph's desire for faculty to be more involved and not just leave orientation to, to folks in student affairs, although I really appreciate our partnership with student affairs and, and what they're doing and, and see them as great, great partners. Um, but I don't think we should assume that faculty are uh, the torchbearers for heterodox academies values <laughs> and, and what we're here talking about today. And, and in fact, in some ways I'm most, I'm concerned about, about faculty in that, in that way. And so I don't um, think just more faculty involvement ensures um, success. And I say that as a faculty member, that's why I think that we need to find concrete ways um, to, to model um, from the outset, you know, from, from the orientation program, what these values are um, and what that mission of the university is, which is is contested. And, and you've talked to a bunch of faculty, they're not going to agree on, on, on that mission, on, on the definition for that mission. And so if there's a common reading, you know, Martha was talking about the, or several people talked about the, the book that all, all first years get, if it can not only be a book that's not <laughs> from, written by a faculty member, uh, which the optics are terrible, but something that um, that's open ended, that 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 can that cha that's open to challenging, and that um, that really kind of models that uh, that mission that I think we're in, in agreement on in terms of the need for. Um, finding good ideas and and but hearing bad ideas and then being able to explain why they're bad ideas and um just having that that open inquiry which is um more endangered today than it was 20 years ago and therefore you know our orientation programs need to be 
to be different. And we can't just assume that um, these values will just happen uh, magically. I think that that orientations have to be about more than, you know, where to get your ID um, and where the wellness center is, even though those are those are their nuts and bolts things that students need to know where the wellness center is. They need to know about go to the Title IX um, workshop and the anti-hazing um, things that are now required in the state of Ohio. Those are essential, but so are the kind of fundamental um, ethos uh, of a university that's going to be critical when they walk into that that first class too. Thank you. And and you touched also on on something there at the end, which I think might be one of these uh, under discussed driving uh, forces. And maybe you can disabuse me of that. Um, uh, and Joseph, I, I don't know if you have a perspective on this, but it seems like legal compliance, liability, risk management. I mean, there are some basic sort of institutional um drivers that lead to maybe unintentionally students getting a whole dose of reassurances and um, cover your posterior sort of speeches from, from a university. Um, how much have you seen that play into it? And are, are there are there ways to, to sort of do what you have to do, but also, you know, keep your focus on what's really central to a university? I think so. Um, I think there's a way um, like to do that. So I'll, you know, I'll say I'm not an expert on the the like legal, you know, end of things. I I understand why you know all of that is included in um, or, or, or orientation, you know, obviously. But um, I think the like the key to that would be uh, balance. And and so you know a typical orientation, you know, might be like six to seven hours long per day. You know, if it's like like multiple days, usually it's an all day thing. I would say, you know, uh, like, like like set time, you know, aside for the kind of housekeeping, you know, stuff, the eagle compliance related things, like risk management, all you know, all of that, while at the same time, you know, devoting an equal amount of of time for you know uh like faculty who you know maybe are in um uh the same discipline but you know have different outlooks on that um, like specific discipline or have have faculty together who are you know from two completely completely different disciplines and um you know have a mock uh discussion, you know, that include students in it. I earlier I I, you know, uh kind of inadvertently advocated for the just blind, you know, inclusion of of uh of of faculty members, but it's like really the 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 key to what I meant was, you know, invite faculty in allows for uh these sorts of questions to be asked because these are not typically questions that um, student like student affairs professionals um, take into account all the time. Um, so I kind of took that in a different direction. <laughs> Sorry about that, but yeah. Not at all. Um, I'll just interject to say, I, I think um, I'd love to turn the conversation towards some of the some of the proactive ideas that are out there, whether they're programs being offered now, types of approaches that we've seen on any campus or even just you know speculative ideas I'll also invite uh, our our audience uh you know if you're aware of, of programs of resources we'd love to feature them on our website uh, and we'd love to know about them so please share those in the chat if you if you know of some some best practices um at the same time if anybody has horror stories we can hear them too <laughs> um yeah. for our for our panelists, um, I'll pose those same questions to you. Have you seen bright spots? Have you seen this go terribly wrong? Like help us sort of fill out the canvas here. I, I can tell one sort of horror story, um, but the, there's an upside. Um, and that is when I was um, part of those planning meetings for the um, first year experience, the orientation and complication ceremonies. 
um, I, I saw how easy it is to shift things. Um, in this case, it's shifted in what I think is the wrong direction, but I saw um, the, uh, the representatives from the athletics program come in and suggest that instead of doing the convocation ceremony the way we had normally done it, what we really need to do is march the students to the football stadium and teach them the fight song and, you know, introduce them to the mascot and so forth. And to me, that really encroached upon the academic purpose of that kind of ceremony and of the real purpose of orientation. And yet they showed up at the table and they pitched the idea and they got their way. So that that's kind of a horror story. But the upside to me is that um, I no longer underestimate um, what one or two individuals with some strategic plans can accomplish. And so I think it's really up to say faculty who um, or anyone who's concerned about um, first year um, orientation or programs in general um, becoming an ideological monoculture or something um, to get involved. And, you know, there's lots of ways you can get involved without giving up your research and becoming a director of the first year experience on your campus. You could be willing to serve on the selection committee or the review committee of the person in charge of orientation or the first year experience. You could serve on a, or create a faculty senate committee or an ad hoc committee at your university to review and participate in improving new student orientation. Um, and so, and you know, there's probably other examples, but I, I think even the, um, the trend now for universities to give their students bucket lists and, and to encourage them to create these bucket lists where they decide what sorts of experiences they wanna make sure they have while they're on the campus. And that's a really neat idea. And I think we need to make sure that open inquiry and being exposed to um, uh, models of and opportunities to practice constructive disagreement and um, and these and, and you know, learn to think critically and logically and all those things go on the bucket list. So I think there's ways to um, sort of uh, push for some of these values uh, in in little ways and I think it can work. I think a lot of people are just ignoring it and disenga disengaged, so they don't, they're not, they're not contributing positively the way they could. Maybe I could just chime in quickly to, to say I, I, I totally agree, and I think you know one of the things I noticed there was a, a comment in the chat box about ensuring that um, successful programs that are part of orientation are not kind of just one-offs, that it's just an orientation and then there's no follow through. It's not a regular part of, of the campus culture. And so, um, you know, in, in our case, one of the things that we've tried to emphasize, and again, it's only been a year with this, with this debate as part of orientation. And apparently there are a number of other universities that are now also doing debates as part of orientation, but we want to make sure that our students know that debate and a dialogue across difference is an ingrained part of our campus culture that there's a braver angels debate in september just you know three weeks after the the orientation and we're going to have one every month of the year um we have a series called minds wide open where we have sort of a podcast zoom conversation with a um, thought leader or somebody who's written an important book on a topic and brings a perspective that you're not going to find probably in one of our speaker series on campus. Um, and, and that's on our bucket list. We give first years a little magnet bucket list. And one of the things on there is to participate in a Minds Wide Open um, a program during the year to attend a Braver Angels debate. And so I think that if we're able to plug those kinds of things in the orientation, in our case, we're at a debate and say like, this is, this is who we are. This is our campus. This is, this is, these are our expectations. These are the norms. Um, and, and they're the norms in, in classes too, and in, in residence halls. And we set that tone and expectation from day one. I think that that really is helpful, but I agree that it needs to be something that's sustained um, and not just not a just a one off that we then don't deliver on um, beyond the orientation. I um, 
I'm glad you went to the the chat, Adam. And I think uh, I think Leon's question is is an important one. Um, we want to be building toward that sense of identity, and this is how we do things here. These are community norms. Um, I will. Um, I think it's a, actually a good time to get to a few other uh, questions from from our audience. Um, so uh, the the one is uh, the one I want to start with is um, from anonymous. Uh, who asks, the research on the positive impacts of belonging, uh, which Joseph uh, referenced earlier, is quite strong, but how can we communicate to students that belonging is not the same as never being uncomfortable with ideas? And maybe that's a variation on what I asked earlier of sort of best practices that are that are out there. Um, uh, I take it that, um, you know, early exposure to debate and actually challenging ideas uh, as as a celebrated thing it is part of of how you send that message um but uh, what else can can universities do well one thing i would think about is just to um really remind students that um, one, college is not like high school. I, th I don't think we do that enough. It's not just that they have to make sure they wake up on their own and get to class on time and no one's actually going to make sure they do that other than themselves, but that, th that they really are um, ex can expect to encounter ideas that are shocking and maybe even offensive. Um, and that this is part of the academic project and we're not going to shelter them from uh, tough uh, arguments or new ideas that even if they find those offensive. And I remember the um, 2022 Heterodox Academy Leadership Award winner, the college president, um, Rosalind Clark Artis. She spoke uh, in 2022 in Denver and when accepting the award and she said something like, you know, physically, I am here to protect you, but intellectually, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> and it was just so refreshing to hear someone put it that way. And I think that I, and I imagine that students are hungry for that in a way. They, they want that challenge and they, and they want us to tell them our job is to make sure that they are safe uh, physically and because, of, and of course, if you're not, you can't learn. We don't meet our university's mission. Um, but if you're not challenged uh, intellectually and you're not offended at some point, we're not meeting our mission either. If I could um, add on to that too. So, I mean, I, I um, you know, agree. Uh, first of all, I, I think, uh, it can get clear to students that belonging refers to them personally. Um, you know, like is is the uh, the key there to um, you know um, letting the, them know that you know when they get into a a, um, a course that they are going to be you know like uh very likely challenged by a a professor or a a peer and that they can't take that as uh combative um in a uh like a negative sense it's you know obviously combative in a uh a figurative sense um to disagree but you know what i mean i think we have to understand that students coming in uh, to college may not have had that um, um, experience because a, a a great number of avenues of you know modern adolescence and young adulthood have become you know uh, arenas for you know. Over, overwhelming agreement, nurturing, and uh, welcoming, which is obviously okay. Um, but I think, you know, those of us in higher education need to prepare them through things, you know, like orientation and make it clear to them that, you know, um, a lot that goes on in orientation 
uh, serves to connect them personally. And if we, you know, if we don't go beyond that, we're, you know, you know, setting them up for difficulty when they leave orientation and the next day, you know, go into a, um, a current events course or a, you know, an English course that's, you know, you know focused on, on something, um, you know, uncomfortable. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of conversation here about, you know, the meaning of, of belonging and belongingness. Uh, I want to share a comment from the chat. Uh, McAllister Bell says, I wonder how institutions can characterize belongingness in such a way that doesn't actually encourage more polarization. At institutions where most of the students and faculty have very similar political commitments, how does the appeal to belongingness encourage or rather does the appeal to belongingness encourage groupthink? Um, I, I think we're, we're hearing several people suggest that, that that could be a slippery slope, uh, but there's ways to frame it differently. Um, I, I also just wanted to mention that there might be a connection here to uh, some of the, um, the larger messages that universities and, college, and colleges uh, engage in. Um, so to that point, if you have a college that doesn't really have a strong policy about institutional neutrality on contested questions in society, um, then it's not hard to read between the lines to understand, well, when we say we stand for something as the university, who's included in that we and who isn't? And so I, I think uh, belonging can, can take some interesting directions. Um, even, even colleges that, that have a, pioneering programs in, in dialogue can also at the same time have, uh, you know, very public facing uh, commitments to different sorts of values or, uh, you know, a moral framework that they're really introducing to, to students at, 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 um, at orientation. Um, Adam, I don't exactly want to put you on the spot, but I'm curious if you've seen this come up at, at Denison, because, you know, I know that they've done a lot of great work or with the debates, but I, I visited the homepage. There's, you know, a, a commitment to anti-racism and all kinds of things that HXA members might want to debate the uh, the specifics about. Is there a way that that sort of questioning orthodoxy coexists with a sense of, you know, these are our priorities as a community that are um, that are important to us, and you should know that when you come here. Yeah, no, this is it's a hard a hard question, and I and I think a, a tension that. Um, institutions and presidents increasingly face with the pressure, really peer pressure um, in higher ed, uh, especially in recent years for um, university presidents to um, make a statement uh, on issue after issue after issue. And I think, I think, I mean, my own personal view is that um, this has gone way too far, and that there, there are real, there, there are pitfalls and dangers in, in, in um, presidents making sort of in, taking institutional stances on things that don't directly relate to the university's mission. Um, you know, I, I mean, it, it's never ending. It's a slippery slope. At what point, um, you know, what does a president not have to weigh in on in terms of challenge international? challenges, domestic, and so on and so forth. And unless it's something that, that uh, you know, take the, the recent U.S. Supreme Court affirmative action um, decision, um, you know, obviously that, that directly relates to, to universities, their mission, their admissions. Um, even there, I think it's, it's, it's perilous terrain because the last thing you want to do as a president is um, call attention to your university if you're going to Say the, we're going to defy the law. <laughs> um, look out that that's not smart strategy. And, but but I think you can talk about um, values, fundamental values that that your university is going to um, that will not change or something like that. But but I do think that the the issue of and this whole issue of, of peer pressure to take stances um, is is tricky, especially if you're at the same time wanting to say. 
we're open, we're a campus open to the, the you know, op open inquiry and exchange of ideas and so forth, neutrality um, in a sense. And so that, that's an argument for not be, being very selective about what you take stances on. Um, and I think, you know, who's going to, I don't think a lot of people are going to argue that, you know, be against anti-racism, but then what is anti-racism and what does that include? And so, um, yeah, no, I think this is a, this is a, 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 a tricky issue. I feel fortunate that our president has been quite, uh, you know, brave. I, I really think in, uh, on the forefront of saying, you know, we, we will, we have a very, we have, we're, you know, part of the Chicago principles on, on academic freedom. And we really want to make sure that our classrooms and our campus in general is a place for, for open inquiry. Thank you. And uh, I will also quickly plug um, Adam and his uh, college president were, uh, were interviewed. I think someone shared the link in the chat uh, on a podcast called Higher Ed Now, where they really talk through a lot of examples of um, the, the debates, what was behind them, some of the educational motivations, you know, helping students sharpen their thinking and so forth. So that that is also worth a listen. Um, I want to share another comment from our Q&A box. Um, and uh, uh, it, maybe it's a sign of our trustful age. We have a lot of anonymous people making comments. Maybe I should stop saying names on the stream. But um, uh, anonymous attendee says, I'm curious if in orientation debates, students are assigned to argue for certain positions. I think at my institution, just giving students space to argue for a controversial view would result in silence. There are very strong norms surrounding not offending anyone, and this makes debates in the classroom very difficult in my experience. So I wonder what specifically we could do to combat this, end quote. Um, I, I certainly know that there are, there are uh, classroom techniques that involve, you know, uh, arguing for uh, sort of predetermined positions or, or arguing for the position you don't hold. Um, any of our panelists want to weigh in on that one? I'll, I'll, I'll mention something, sorry. One, one thing that I think is important to do is remind everyone, including new students, that um, not all college classes are debates about something. Um, you think of a whole variety of courses that would not involve students sharing their opinion about anything, and it wouldn't be the professor's opinion either, for that matter. And so um, I think when we do have something we might consider a discussion or you know, deliberate something in class, I would like to frame it as really um, giving students the opportunity to apply the methods of the field that of the class they're in. Um, it's not about uh, just saying their own personal opinion or political viewpoint. Um, and even if they're engaged in some sort of big debate, it would presumably be about learning how to debate, learning the methods of debate, and um, not um, because the importance of being in a college class is to say what your opinion is necessarily. So I think that is um, a, a, a little bit of a strange expectation that some students have that I think we could do better um, with uh, reframing and talking about what is the purpose of being in a college classroom. And, and there will be lively discussions, we would hope, in a college class, um, but not necessarily for um, a, to share opinions that then people have to be afraid they're going to offend other people with, um, but really just giving them a chance to apply the methods of the field. And I think that lowers the temperature from the start so that students can feel more comfortable engaging in that kind of deliberation and, dis and discussion, even when there's disagreement in different points of view. I agree, and, I'm just gonna, yeah. sorry, I'm just gonna say, I noticed somebody mentioned in the chat box role-playing, um, which, which also can be a way, great way to lower the temperature and, and depersonalize this and make it about ideas and arguments and not 
the person and their own personal opinion. Um, one thing that I do, I mean, this is just because my own field uh, is medieval history, but I like to share with students um, examples historically uh, from universities going back to the to the 1200s, uh, 1300s in the Middle Ages, how central disputations and debates were to university life, and that in many ways, many examples of students and and professors um, take, having to take multiple sides uh, and argue for something and argue against something. This was the standard way to approach all all problems for, for hundreds of years. You have Thomas Aquinas arguing that ambition is a sin and then arguing, no, actually ambition is not a sin. And all the counter arguments on, on both sides. Um, and, and for them to sort of practice doing this, I think it, there are just such, such valuable skills of, being, of having to, to develop the best arguments you can. Um, and, and it's not always just a for and against. There's a lot of, of in-betweens, all spectrum. Um, but I think that that's, I agree with Martha, that it's not applicable in every discipline or for, for every course. Um, but I do think that it's healthy to um, give students the experience uh, and exposure that this has been a, a, a norm, uh, a, a educational norm for, for a very, very long time. I'm... Thank you so much. And, uh, and I'll actually last word. Go ahead, Joseph. Add to, so uh, real quick. So like another avenue, you know, you could take, I support the, you know, having uh, someone argue for something, uh, you know, they don't necessarily agree with. Another avenue is potentially, um, you know, break students up in two groups or pairs or, you know, however, and pose, you know, a group of topics and focus on similarities and, and, and differences have them go through uh the the process of of trying to you know discover with that other person what they agree on and what they don't absolutely um i've i've shared a couple more resources in the chat i'll encourage anyone else to to do the same uh and again i'm i'm very serious if you're aware of great tools syllabi programs we would love to to drive some eyeballs to them and feature them so uh please feel free to to find us at heterodoxacademy.org and, and share those so we can we can help these sorts of uh efforts get get more traction um i want to thank the panelists that have joined us today and uh before we go uh give them an opportunity to tell us where to find them and follow them on the internet or in real life um, Adam, where can we find your work? I'm afraid I'm a pretty inactive uh, Twitter user. I haven't <laughs> looked at it in a long time. Um, but but there is the the podcast interview that that was mentioned earlier on uh, in uh, higher ed now from from last year. Thank you. Um, we're too busy enlightening young minds to bother on the internet, and that that's a good thing. Um, Joseph, is there somewhere or or some piece of work that you'd like us to share with the audience? Yeah, so I mean, um, uh, social media wise, you, know, you can follow me on on Twitter at Joseph Guar, and I've also written uh, quite a few pieces for Heterodox um, Academy. So. You know, if you're interested in more of the uh, the the student affairs end of you know all this, I would you know um, encourage people to uh, check those out. And finally, Martha, what what's some of your work that uh, you'd like to plug? Uh, um, I I did write two sh really short pieces, um, one on keeping the first year experience academic, or at least keeping an academic component to it, and um, the importance of um, common reading programs as intellectual introductions to the university, if you can manage to stay out of the culture wars. So I'll post those into the chat because they're links. Um, so for anyone who wants to see those. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, and I can't help myself. I will also commend another piece by by Martha, which is she she wrote a piece called the um, 
the shadow curriculum, which talked more about that uh, difference between um, uh, student affairs and, and the faculty. Shout out to all of our HXA members who work in student affairs. Um, we love you all. We know sometimes it can be lonely there. So this is all meant to try to you know work together to bring universities to, to support open inquiry. Um, all right, before uh, before we break, I just want to thank everyone who joined us to, to the person who asked uh, who was uh, who was in the chat because they couldn't see the number. We were at about 75 to 80 folks, a little smaller here in August, but a lively conversation that we that we enjoyed. Um, again, if you are not a member of HXA or you don't get our emails, uh, please find us online. Um, we are we are activating uh, with Martha's leadership. We are uh, adding uh, campus communities and presence on specific campuses. Um, but we'd love for you to get involved uh, in our uh, online HX communities, uh, in our events that are coming up this year, uh, and in grant programs and other kinds of exciting things that are happening. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. And if you are orienting your students uh, to the pursuit of truth, uh, I hope it goes well for you this year. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.